I'm Shanna Martin, host of the Tech Tools for Teachers podcast, a part of the Education Podcast Network, just like the show you're listening to now. Shows on the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other interesting education podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com. Hey, welcome back. Steve here. And today I'm talking with Frederick Buskey. That's right. He's back and he's talking about his book, A School Leader's Guide to Reclaiming Purpose. A must read for every school leader. You're going to love this book. It's a powerful, practical resource for you. So much to learn. And by the way, before you go, it'd be so cool if you uh, took time to help out the podcast. And I got a few ideas for you. One, you could tell a friend and share the links. Uh, Two, you could go to my website and leave a review and subscribe. And three, how about click on the link on my website, homepage that says buy me a coffee Uh, by doing this you could donate five dollars or something uh, to help address the costs associated with producing the podcast what do you think that'd be so cool you are awesome enjoy the show hey everyone you can buy frederick buskey's new book a school leader's guide to reclaiming purpose by going to amazon or his website if you would like 15 or more copies, his publisher will authorize a nice discount. Reach out to Frederick at frederick at frederickbuskey.com and let him know that you would like 15 or more copies. Great book for all school leaders. Don't miss out. Out to supervise one of my interns, and I checked in with my intern, and then I went to visit the assistant principal. And I walk in her office, and you know how it is when you walk into somebody's office and you immediately know that it's not a good day. Her, her hair's out of place, her cheeks are flushed, and she's got papers all over her desk. And I say, Kelly, what, what's wrong? And she holds up this stack of yellow forms, and she shakes them, and she said, it is 10 o'clock in the morning. I have seven office referrals. I was going to get in and work with some teachers and do some professional development, and now every one of these is going to take me 45 minutes. My day's over. And, and she was close to tears. It's the Education Podcast, your favorite show, with lots of groovy guests and they share what they know. So crank it up the tin and let your neighbors know that here's another show with Dr. Steve Milletto. Teaching, learning, leading, K-12. Teaching, learning, leading, K-12. Teaching, learning, leading, K-12. Ah, ah, with Dr. Steve Milletto. Frederick Buskey helps school leaders reclaim their purpose. Building on 33 years of K-12 and higher education leadership experience, Frederick provides simple frameworks and practical tools to help leaders make immediate incremental improvements. His new book, A School Leader's Guide to Reclaiming Purpose, helps leaders master six stages to move from spending time putting out fires to investing time in growing teachers. Frederick hosts the Assistant Principal Podcast, writes a daily leadership email, and develops short, powerful courses for teachers and those who serve them. Learn more about Frederick on his website at frederickbuskey.com, and I'll have that link in the show notes. And uh, our focus today is his book, A School Leader's Guide to Reclaiming Purpose. It's awesome, and you're going to love it. Frederick, great to have you back on the show. Say hi to everybody. Steve, it's so good to be back. Well, glad to have you here, and, uh, you know, Cool book. I, your your book's awesome. Having you know, for someone who's been in the roles of uh, well, I, I think this will say everything. I, this is my thirty seventh year. I'm getting ready to go into my thirty eighth year in public education in Georgia, and having been in lots of different roles, I mean, you hit the nail on the head so much in in your book, and um, I love it. I you know, and by the way, um, Frederick didn't pay me to say that. All right, so <laughs> no money exchanging hands here. Um, yeah, our focus today is your book, A School Leader's Guide to Reclaiming Purpose. Why'd you write it? Well, I want to say on the front end that there's not a lot new in the book. I just stole a lot of stuff from good people. So and and I think what I'm what I really tried to do was take all the great things that I stole from everybody else and put it into a package that made all these great practices more accessible to people. So I'll start there. The genesis for the book came out of one of my experiences when I was still at Clemson University. I was in the principal licensure program and I was out in a rural elementary school in South Carolina in April out to supervise one of my interns. And I checked in with my intern and then I went to visit the assistant principal and I walk in her office and you know how it is when you walk into somebody's office and you immediately know (laughs) it's not a good day. Her, her hair's out of place, her cheeks are flushed, and she's got papers all over her desk. And I said, Kelly, what, what's wrong? And she holds up this stack of yellow forms, 
and she shakes them and she said, it is 10 o'clock in the morning. I have seven office referrals. I was going to get in and work with some teachers and do some professional development. And now every one of these is going to take me 45 minutes. My day's over. And, and she was close to tears. And I asked her, Kelly, of those seven referrals, how many of those are more about the teacher than they are about the student? And she paused and she said five. So here's this bright, passionate assistant principal who knows how to develop teachers and knows that if she can just get in the classroom and work with those teachers, she's not going to have seven discipline referrals at 10 o'clock in the morning. And when I left there, I, I literally just sat in my car and, and to me, this was so tragic. And, and yet almost every school I went into, I would hear similar stories from especially assistant principals, but also principals who are just overwhelmed with the day-to-day -day tasks. And Steve, what I really wanted to write about was how you go develop your teachers. But I realized I, I can't do that until I try to help people be able to move from where they are to to back to the purpose the reason they got into it yeah that's so that's it's such an incredible discussion and and uh, you know we're talking about epiphanies at some point possibly but you know it, it, but on your own to have that epiphany which is that uh, this is a problem and i can imagine walking into her, her office and see and listening to her talk about that i mean i i think about uh because sometimes you deal with some discipline and it could take you multiple, not just, there's not just an hour. It might take you four or five days to, to deal with whatever the situation <laughs> yeah. is. And then on top of that, at some point you're, you know, whatever else it is that you're assigned to do. And somewhere in there is working with teachers and instructional <laughs> progress and things like this. And, uh, you know, you're going, Hmm, maybe, yeah. uh, you know, next Tuesday after the following, you know, <laughs> I, I was trying to think of what, Wimpy used to say with the, the Popeye cartoons, but the, uh, but anyway, the point is, boy, that's an outdated reference. <laughs> 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 but you know, anyway, I, I just think it's, it, I think this is a universal problem because you know it's so, uh, uh, it's so easy to get caught up in all those weeds, and it's worse now than it was a few years ago because the number of teachers that we come, we have coming in the profession that are alternative licensure teachers. So we're getting people dropped into classrooms with literally don't even know what the idea of classroom management is. They just think you drop in the classroom and, and you start teaching your stuff. And we are going to have so much, we do have so much churn. And if we can't get in early on and consistently to help support those new teachers, the churn's just going to continue. You're so right. So right. And that is, is, is such a, I, I like what you s said there because a lot of them do think that all, all I have to do is just go in there, become prepared to, for class. And I talk, you know, it's like, yeah, no, that's the, <laughs> but it's not their fault. Right. right? I mean, right. it's the situation that they're being thrown into. Okay. And I, I, I would like us, I challenge us to really reimagine what, that first year looks like in the way we onboard teachers and and to move away from thinking about entry year teachers to thinking about early career teachers because in this day and age with the with what teachers are coming in with their skills and with the demands that students have the needs that students have now compared to even five years ago but 10 years ago we need to be thinking about supporting teachers very heavily through their first through fifth years you got that right <laughs> Most definitely. I, all right. So let's start shifting into your book. In the beginning of your book, you connect your focus to that of a journey, and more specifically, the journey of Apollo 13. Now, this is cool. I grew up in Daytona Beach, Florida, and uh, in the days of the Apollo missions and uh, was glued to my set in, in certain days and stuff like this. Uh, could you share why you chose this particular space journey? Yeah, so Apollo 13 is a fantastic leadership movie. 
absolutely fantastic. So if anybody listening has not seen the movie, you've got to go watch this movie. The thing that really captured me was this idea that we're getting back to something. And in Apollo 13, they have an accident. They're orbiting the moon. Stuff goes sideways. And they've got to figure out how to get back to Earth. And they have to come up with some really creative ways of doing it and they have to fundamentally shift their paradigm they have to shift the way they look at things to get creative to to get back there and it just seemed to me that that was the journey that i was trying to help people get to that we all know why we got into leadership we have that purpose but the urgency of the job takes us away from that purpose where we are spending more time on tasks and investing less time in people and and to get back we've got to make a fundamental shift so i just it just seemed like a great parallel to me and helped me organize thoughts and organize the stages into the book well it works really well and it's a it's a great analogy and a great connection there and uh um so kudos on that uh you know, before we go any further, let's talk about the formatting of Reclaiming Purpose. And there's there's a whole bunch of really cool things that you do in the book that help you revisit what you thought about, you know, what's being read or the way you start the chapters. And uh, and that's what I want to look at. Is each chapter called a stage starts with a question and a listing of goals. You know, what inspired you to start each stage in this manner? I think there are two things. One is it is a guidebook. So each stage is meant to lead you or help you get from one place to the next place. So the question helps anchor where you are, but also gives you a hint into where we're going. The other thing that the question is meant to do is to reconnect you with all of the stuff you already know. Because I think as people read through the book, they're going to see a lot of things like, oh, yeah, I know that, I know that, I know that. But then they're going to be able to connect those things about why they're important. So it's not as much about learning new things. It's about reconnecting to the things you already know in a more purposeful way. You know, one of the the, the things that uh, is really cool about this is that just the idea of that, you look at that question, the name of the stage, and then you look at that question, and it really jump starts your thoughts about what's coming next. Because then, under that question, then you have this list of goals, and uh, and so if the reader missed where you're going with that first question, they're going to get it with those <laughs> those goals there. So I like I like that because then that's something. What I think is really cool about it is, as a reader, when I f- go through the stage, I'm going to come back and want to look at that again to see if. Um, if I got what you're talking about um, for that, for that stage. So, like. yeah. And we tried to leave decent spacing uh, and the margins are smaller than I would have liked, but my idea as people work through this is that they could just, they would write, you could underline, you could write notes all over the book. It's meant really to be consumed. And most of the chapters, I tried to keep them to something where you could read it in 15 minutes. Right. Because as an assist, assistant principal, you're not going to sit down and have an hour to read a book. And I wanted something where you could flip through this, you could flip through a chapter in 10, 15 minutes and get a couple of nuggets that would help you to make life better immediately. Well, I think you've accomplished that. And I think it works really well. Yeah. On, on page 13, you note while urgent leaders are often highly productive. They frequently end their days frustrated and exhausted. Could you explain what you mean and connect this to the Eisenhower matrix? Yeah, one of the things that I think people recognize the term is adrenaline junkie. So you get into that assistant principalship and it is like go, go, go all day long. And we get so accustomed to working on putting out fires that when that happens, we get this little shot of adrenaline, right? So, oh, so-and-so needs you in 305. Okay. And the chemicals kick in and we run down there and we deal with whatever we need to deal with. And then there's a leak in cafeteria. So you run down there and then we've got five emails I know are piling up. So I knock those out and, and we become conditioned to reacting 
we become conditioned to focusing on ticking off tasks. And, and so in the beginning, that's okay because we feel like we're being useful. We feel important, but over time, we become less and less connected to our teachers and less and less able to develop and grow our teachers. And, and it, and it's the fundamental shift that I want people to make in this book is to move from tasks to people. And, and we just talked about Apollo 13. And, and one of the things they had to do was instead of just turning around and blasting through the gravitational pull of the moon, they lost their power. And so that what they had to do was wrap around and use the gravitational pull as a slingshot to break them out of the atmosphere. And, and to me, the slingshot is moving from a perspective of time management to a perspective of priority management. You are never going to manage your time enough to break out of the gravitational pull of urgency. The big shift, I think if people take two things away from today's interview. The first one is get away from the mindset of time management and move to priority management. That's awesome. And I got to tell you, one of the things that, uh, cause you're talking to somebody who I've been through, you know, I've, I've worked in different school systems and for some reason, each school system I went to, they made sure that all their administrators, whether you had it before or not, went through time management. And, uh, you know, one of the most frustrating things in those days was that uh, you're, it was a big notebook that you carry around with calendar pages and all that. And, uh, you know, it doesn't help if the person who's being trained leaves the notebook someplace and uh, <laughs> along with the pages. You know, the nice thing about today's world is, you know, it, it all sticks now because I have my calendar in my pocket on my phone, you know, with all the little notes to it and everything like that, as well as all the alarms that I could ever set in the world. Um, to help me remember things, you know, because I think it's so easy, whatever you're doing, to get just get so task oriented, and uh, there are people in the building. You know? <laughs> you know? Yeah, well, and there's nothing wrong with time management practices, but if all you're doing is using them to manage tasks, then you're miss you're missing the boat. So once we figure out what our priorities are and we tar- start to schedule in our priorities, then we can actually leverage time management. Oh, I love that. And, you know, when, when you're talking about the priority management, you know, it, you know, everything can't be a priority. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and, you know, going back to that teacher that's brand new in the profession, doesn't know how to manage a classroom. If, if that's not, if the classroom isn't burning down, then it's not urgent. And, and so we, I like to use the Eisenhower matrix as a way to kind of ground people in thinking about this idea of priorities versus urgency. And the Eisenhower matrix has those four quadrants, right? And quadrant one is urgent and important. So those are the things that involve safety and they involve those legal obligations that you have to meet or they're going to shut you down, right? So that's, that's quadrant one. Those things have to get done. Quadrant three is urgent, but not important. And what frequently happens is we become so attuned to urgency that we're not discerning the difference between what's really important and what's not as important. The work of developing teachers is quadrant two work. And so if we're stuck in urgent mode and we're working in quadrants one and three, we are not working in quadrant two, which means we're not growing our teachers. And Steve, I like to think about the role of school leaders. Number one, keep everybody safe. Number two, create better learning opportunities for kids, right? Help kids grow. The thing is we don't teach kids. So if, if we want to impact kids, we have to impact teachers. So stated, restated, the job of school leadership is to keep everybody safe and to grow your teachers. And so for me, as much of your time and attention as you can give to growing your teachers, that's where you're making your school better. Like if all of our teachers in a school were 20% better at the end of the year, what would that mean? 
across the board for everything we do in our school if our teachers were 20% better. Wow. You know, that's, that's so powerful. That's, it, it, and it takes the time and effort, and it's, it's so easy to get caught up in. I mean, it, it, just every little thing, you know, and it, you know, people refer to it as putting out fires or, you know, it's, it, everything seems like a priority because you got to do this, you got to be there, you got to be there, you got to do this, you got to do that. And, and it, you know, learning about how to change that focus is so important because you, you still had to solve those problems. I mean, cause you got the, you got the situation that happened between two kids. It's not going away for a couple of days. It's not going away for a couple of days. And, and you've got to figure out how to, um, which as you were setting your priorities, you know, how can I put some time in there? How, and also this is where a little bit of delegation comes involved as well, or figuring out how to get some help. <laughs> so, yeah, I think there's three parts to that. Well, the, back to Apollo 13. So, so when they, when they burst out of the atmosphere of the moon and they're headed back to earth, they realized they were going to run out of power. Like the batteries in the, in the capsule were going to fail. And so they went through this process of powering down everything. So they had to be super analytical. They cut every system that wasn't absolutely necessary for sustaining life in the capsule. They, they, they cut the heat down and all this stuff. And, and that's one of the stages is to power down. You've got to figure out a way to do less. And, and there are some tips for doing that. And, and moving back to your purpose is again, moving to that priority management from time management, powering down and doing less, but it's also building systems in place. So if we're going to delegate, we need to have systems in place to support those people so that the delegation is not just another burden for them. Delegation is not a drop in quality, right? So there are systems that we can build in and we can start shifting our organization. So it's not just me that's focused on growing people, but there are things I can do to create an organization that is focused on growing people. Awesome. I love it. The, you know, uh, earlier I was talking about the questions, the way you start off each stage. And the question for stage two, which is titled the U-turn, is this. If the approach you're using now, urgent leadership, isn't taking you where you want to go, what are some things you could change? So let's let's talk about this for a minute. That's a really <laughs> wide question. So one of the other big things in the book, and I, I know you have this on one of our quest, one of our other um, questions, but I'm going to jump right to it. It's these three epiphanies. And again, I, I learned these from other people. The first epiphany is that I can't do everything, right? There's too much to do. You could work 24 hours a day, and there is always going to be more to do in this job. Once you accept that first epiphany that you can't do everything that leads to the second epiphany. And the second epiphany is if I can't do everything, then I can choose what gets done and what doesn't get done. And, and that, that is huge to stop and think about, okay, I can't do all this. Which part of this am I not going to do? And where that brings us is in the realm of intentionality. So now when I'm in urgent leadership, I'm just reacting. And whatever doesn't get done is what I didn't get to at the end of the day. When I become intentional and I embrace that second epiphany and I realize I have choice, then what I can do is start to think about what are my priorities. I, I have to get into that teacher's room. That is the priority. And so I get that as the main driver of what I'm doing. And now I can choose, okay, that means there's other stuff that's not going to get done. What am I going to move off my plate today so that I can get into that teacher's classroom? And then the third epiphany, which I sometimes wrestle with, is that our choices on what gets done and not gets done reflect our values. So if I say I'm an instructional leader, and I say I want the best education for my kids, and I say I'm here to support teachers, and I can't get into that beginning teacher's classroom for, for five minutes, 
I can't check in with them at the end of the day and see what they need. If I can't do that, then what does that actually say about my values? You know, I think a lot of times we don't take time to stop and think about that. And, and especially if you're new to the role and unless somebody has actually sat you down and is having multiple conversations with you uh, about doing this, you get caught up in the idea of, you know, at the end of the day or end of the week, what did I get done this week? You know, and. Yes. Yeah. I, I like to think about, I talk about time is spending time versus investing time. So spending time is getting stuff done and there's, there's nothing wrong with that. But once you've done that thing, that time is gone versus investing time and investing time is when we put time into something that is going to pay us back. So you invest time with your teachers. I'm heading out on vacation next week and I'm going to invest time with my mom and, and doing that is making memories that I will be able to hold on to long after she's gone, right? That is an investment of time versus going and just spending time with her and doing things in a way that's not intentionally creating special moments. And so that's another one of those big pieces for people to think about is spending time versus investing time. You know, I think in making, in making those choices, like you said, you know, when you're, when you're, investing time you know there's so much to uh, just in the day in the life of an assistant principal or principal or classroom teacher but i want to go to the assistant principal for a minute because a lot of times you are on you know some super ludicrous speed to steal from a little bit from mel brooks they uh you know we're and you're handling 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 and you're trying to deal with this stuff and you you have to have at some point someone say to you, okay, you need to take a breath and you need to really look at, have you accomplished some of this other people stuff that you've got to not just get done, but that you need to work on as opposed to just handling each little piece of paper that's put in your box or something like that as it's, as if it's a, you know, one of those types of tasks, a leadership task where, you know, the in mail out mail box type thing. Yeah, and I want to be explicit to even if you work through and you're able to implement everything that's in the book, I'm not promising people that you're going to have hours a day that you can leisurely stroll in, drink your coffee, read the paper, and then spend all day in classrooms. That, that is not going to happen. What I'm really trying to do is to help people carve out minutes, like five minutes, 10 minutes in a day. If you're if flipping and moving some of these pra- using some of these practices can save you five minutes a day, then there are actually a couple strategies in the book that tell you how you can reinvest that five minutes to make a difference with a teacher. Now, it's going to be a small difference. You're not going to change a teacher's world in five minutes a day or in five minutes, but in five minutes a day, you can then begin to make real progress with teachers because one of the things that we can do by coming in by being more intentional about how we invest five minutes with teachers is that we can help them to grow into more reflective practitioners. And if we can help our teachers become more reflective, then they're less reliant on us to grow. So there there are all these little ripple effects that we can achieve, not with big dramatic change, but by making small incremental changes. So I say five minutes here, that lets me invest that with that new teacher. Maybe three weeks later, at five minutes a day, I've helped that teacher grow enough to where they're doing one less discipline referral a week to me. Well, if that's a 45-minute referral, that's nine minutes a day I just got back. So wh- what can I do with that nine minutes? Now maybe I can reach another teacher or two other teachers. So it's just this idea of consistent incremental change. There's nothing that any of us can give an assistant principal that is going to give them an hour back in a day, right? But we can give them a couple minutes and with intentionality and the right tools, you can use that couple of minutes a day to help make a difference in a teacher's life. So important. You know, I, I have to say this, uh, when I was an assistant principal in this very large school, 
uh, one of the things that I did was I was there for for uh, discipline, and uh, during lunchtime I realized there had been a problem that they had had before I'd gotten there of kids smoking in the boys' bathroom specifically that opened into the cafeteria. And so I made, I gave myself a duty station, so I'm right there at that bathroom. And, you know, it's cigarette smoke. You can smell it once it starts in the bathroom. So it's like, so I'm going to be there. So I, I was doing that. So that by being there, it cut down on that. But you're then watching the rest of the cafeteria. And in that school, each lunch had 600 kids there were four lunches 600 kids each time and you know so you're standing there and this kid comes up next to me <laughs> and he says uh i want to ask you a question i said sure go right ahead and he said uh you went to college right and i said yes and he goes he goes and love you pay- kids yes you gotta love him and he, he says you you paid for that college right and i said yes <laughs> and he said uh he said so you paid to go to school so that you could watch me eat <laughs> I said, get away you bother me kid <laughs> but get, you know, yeah what i was gonna say was that you know his point was that i was using a lot of my time just guarding the bathroom and watching them eat lunch and uh i just I think about what you're you talk about in the book and stuff like this even trying to come up with five extra minutes here and there um there's there's ways yeah so i want to tell one more story you talking about the cafeteria. So I had, again, a principal intern and he had morning cafeteria duty. So as the kids were coming in for breakfast and, and he, he told me this, he went to grab his computer because usually what he did, he went down the cafeteria and he would answer email and do his computer tasks while kids were coming in. So his one eye on them and one eye on the computer. And, and we'd been talking a lot about being present how you bring your full presence to people. So he told me he picked up his computer and he thought, nope, I'm going to work on being present. I'm going to put it down. So he goes into the cafeteria and people are coming in and one of the aides comes in and he's like, good morning. How you doing? She goes, oh, I'm fine. But he noticed that there was something wrong. Even though she said she was fine, he noticed there was something wrong because he was present and he was paying attention. And he said, wow, you looks like something's going on and talk to me what's happening. And she proceeded to, they sat down and she shared with him some things. Her father was in the hospital and you know in really bad shape and just the burden of caring. And she unpacked these things in just a matter of a couple minutes with him. And again, he was going to be in that cafeteria anyway. What didn't get done was the email. She unpacks all this. And at the end of that, There'd been a kid, like a second grader sitting there and the second grader crawls up in her lap and gives her a hug. What an amazing, powerful experience for all three of them. Very much so. Because he devoted his full time, his full attention just for five minutes. But you do that, that transforms your school. One little conversation at a time. If I know I'm a teacher, when I go into school, there are people that actually care about how I am, that don't just say, hey, how you doing, and walk by, but they actually want to know, that changes the way I look at my work, that changes the way I walk into the building every day. Does it ever. That's awesome. <laughs> I love that. I, You know, one of the things I want to make sure that I mentioned uh, before we go a little deeper and finish out is you create uh, a framework called the six dimensions of organizations and you list it and you, you explain it to everyone in the book. Uh, what makes this framework important to that leader? So there are a lot of things that you can do with this framework. It, it deals with school culture. It deals with how you make change, but for this discussion, the big thing that it helps us do is to think in terms of teacher development. If I'm going to help a teacher, I talk about support and growth. I want to support and I want to grow my teachers. And those have two distinct meanings. In the six dimensions, we talk about people as kind of the center of it all. And then we have purpose, we have structures, and resources around them. So these four core components of of your building, 
people, purpose, structures, and resources, and then you have external forces and internal forces. When we talk about supporting teachers, what we're talking about doing is aligning the organization to the work that we want teachers to do. We want teachers to be teaching. We want them to be doing great teaching. So how do we have to have clarity of purpose in order to make it easier for teachers to do great teaching? How do we need to structure the day? How do we need to structure professional development? What are all the other structures that we need to have in place to make it easier for teachers to be great teachers? And then what kind of resources do we give them? And what kind of demands do we make? The two most the most valuable resources in a school are people's time and their attention because we can't create more of that. So when we talk about resource demand, what are we asking teachers to do with their re with their time and attention outside of focusing on being great teachers? So supporting teachers is bringing alignment to those pieces to make it easier for teachers to do great teaching. Growth is attending to the teacher themselves. So support is system, growth is a teacher, and we can think about teachers as having four components, their knowledge, their skills, their dispositions, and their health. And so when I'm growing teachers, I'm focusing on one or more of those four attributes. And, and so for this book, that's the biggest value of six dimensions. It lets us think about that quadrant two work of developing teachers. Am I supporting by bringing alignment to the organization or am I growing them by focusing on knowledge, skills, dispositions, and health? Excellent. I think it, uh, it really does a good job of Make us think about how, you know, what it is we're doing. I mean, because I, I think we forget so many times, which <laughs> might have a little bit to do with your title, <laughs> reclaiming purpose and such, but I, I think we forget so much about what it is that we're actually there for and instead get just caught up in just, just minuscule types of uh, activities throughout the days. You know, I, I just think that's uh, it's a, it's easy to understand and under and see where you're going with it and uh so i just want, wanted you to know i really like that framework that's it really brings home what it is you're talking about yeah thank you and i'm i'm a visual learner i'm big on visuals so a lot of these core concepts i've put together into visual frameworks you know the the other thing about the six dimensions when i talk about internal forces it's a way of understanding school culture because oh, we all know how important school culture is but when you actually ask people to define it and to be able to talk about <laughs> what influences school culture, it gets really messy and complicated. And so to me, when I think about school culture, I think about it as a reflection of the alignment within our system. So again, if these, if the structures, purpose and resources are aligned to make teachers jobs easier, that is an aligned culture. That is a positive school culture. And think about being a teacher. If you walk into school and I know everything's focused on me being able to be a great teacher, and I know that there are people in the school that are consistently going to help me grow so that I can get more enjoyment, so that I can have a bigger impact on kids. If that's the environment, I'm not leaving that. I, I will, you'll have to drag me out kicking and screaming that I'm not going to leave that school. And, and so it's a way to take something that's really complex and distill it down into ways that as a leader, I can say, okay, if I want to improve my school culture, I need to help my people grow. If I want to improve my school culture, uh, I need to look at how our duty schedule plays out because that's a fundamental structure that impacts how much time teachers can devote to preparing to be great teachers. Awesome. And and that is so important because that's that's really, to me, that's one of the aspects of what we are doing as an administrator is helping them make that time and get them those resources and and so that they can then make that impact on the kids. Yeah, uh, great stuff. Can I say can I say one final thing that I'd like people to walk away with that we yeah. didn't quite get to, and going back to the idea that time and attention are the most critical resources. At a certain level, we all know that, and one of the biggest things that school leaders can do is to invest time and attention five minutes with the teacher, ask reflective questions, and then not say a word. 
the value that we can bring to teachers is not bringing answers. It's not bringing suggestions. It's not even teaching them. The value is in asking them questions that allow them to reflect and we just listen. Because what a teacher will understand is that if I come to them and I just want to create the space for them to unpack, they understand how valuable that is. They understand that's huge. Sometimes as a leader, we feel like, oh, I have to tell you something. I have the value is in me helping you grow by telling you something. That's not the value. The value is in the silence. The value is in the space that we create. So if you take two things away from today, number one, focus on priority management, not time management. Number two, understand when you ask a reflective question and you stay quiet and create space for a teacher to unpack something, that is absolute gold and the teacher knows it. Love it. Love it. Yes, most definitely. And uh, just it's so important that making time because you just never know where it's uh, how just just the what it's going to do for the person by making the time that that you show that you you're here for them to help them figure out what it is they're trying to figure out. So yeah, <laughs> and that's part of the joy in it. We don't know where right. that's going to lead. Exactly, I love it. I, you know, but we're getting ready to finish up. Before we do that, uh, can you share a little bit about your podcast? the assistant principal podcast. So here's a secret, Steve, you had a conversation with me very early on. I think I was maybe in the 20th episode or something and, and we'd come across each other. I saw you had 500 episodes out and you're kind enough to, to schedule a call. And then when we did a podcast together, I was so impressed. I continue to be so impressed by the way that you transition between elements of the podcast and, and the way you transition between questions, you make it feel like such a conversation that I actually have really modeled a big part of my podcast after your practices. And, and there's times when I'm in the podcast doing it and I'm thinking like, okay, so how would Steve transition this? Cause you just have a way of doing it. And so that's part of what I try to do in the podcast is I want people to tune in and feel like they're listening to two friends have a conversation, right? Because I think nice. there's something that makes us feel good about listening in. So number one, it's that conversation. We try to keep it real, but also bring some, some levity and some inspiration. But I also want to make sure that every episode somebody listens to, they finish that episode and they feel like they got at least one thing that they can go into school that morning and put into practice that's going to help them be a little bit better. Because I, I think those small pieces of immediate value are so important. That's so cool. And I, I'm a subscriber. I enjoy your podcast. By the way, thank you so much for the nice comments you just made. I'm, I'm turning red. So for the kids, <laughs> well, I don't know when, when this is coming out, but uh, you're going to be coming out, I think in, in July, uh, we have that episode all lined up. So that was a great one. Cool. Look forward to hearing it. And I can't thank you enough for what you do. And I enjoy your podcast. I enjoy the the fact that they, what you, you talk about, uh, it, it does, you do have takeaways. You have, uh, you know, the, the idea that the, the person listening is going to come away with some ideas and thoughts about, uh, you know, what's going to help them out in their day. And I, I like that a lot. Um, kudos to you. It, you know, and, uh, Frederick, if someone wanted to follow up and connect with you and or learn more about, you know, how you can help them as a leader, where would you send them? So I love the part about email that allows us to contact, have communication with each other. So people can email me at frederick at frederickbuskey.com. I'm also on LinkedIn every day. So a lot of people will connect with me on LinkedIn and we can begin having conversations there. And then my website is frederickbuskey.com. You can find links to the book. There are book study materials on my website. So people can go in there if they're thinking about doing this as a book study, I try to make that easy. And I think that's, yeah, those are the places that people can connect. Very cool. I'll put that information in the show notes. And uh, this has been great catching up with you again, Frederick. I mean, thanks so much for sharing your book, The School Leader's Guide to Reclaiming Purpose. I love it. It's so helpful information that, you know, it, the big thing is, you know, one of the things we got to do is remember that uh, there's people there. So 
putting that priority on the people and uh, learning to, you know, create priority management. And I, I just think this is a powerful, powerful book you've written and every leader should read it. Thank you, Steve. You know, you, you're, you're a wonderful podcast host and you're an even better person. So thank you for having me on and, and enjoying time together, investing time together. Hey everyone, you can buy Frederick Buskey's new book, A School Leader's Guide to Reclaiming Purpose, by going to Amazon or his website. If you would like 15 or more copies, his publisher will authorize a nice discount. Reach out to Frederick at frederick at frederickbuskey.com and let him know that you would like 15 or more copies. Great book for all school leaders. Don't miss out. Hey, you have been listening to Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12, a podcast to help you help kids achieve their dreams. Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12 is a member of the Education Podcast Network. Podcasts for educators, podcasts by educators. Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12 is a member of the podcast network based in Canada called Voice Ed Radio. Voice Ed Radio, your voice is right here. The opinions expressed on Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12 are those of the guests and hosts. Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12 is intended to share ideas, advice, and suggestions. Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12 is produced for educational purposes. Hey, thanks for listening. It would be awesome if you visited my website at stephenmaletto.com and connected with me, left a review, and listened to more episodes. And by the way, you could also share it with your friends, with your family, and uh, your colleagues. Thanks so much. You're awesome.